So the session that we're having this afternoon is on telomere dysfunction, and we're going to hear about a few diseases of telomere dysfunction, what I call the telomeropathies. And uh, there's been a lot of recent press about telomere tests, and I thought what I'd do is sort of give a quick introduction to that before we introduce the first speaker. Uh, so there's been a lot of information because of uh, a lot of reasons. Uh, the first thing that I want to say is that we know very little about the dynamics of telomere length changes over multiple years in large human populations. This has been one of the rate limiting things that has led us to the uh, feeling that maybe telomere length isn't that important. People measure telomeres in different ways. And the question is, unless we kind of follow large populations over large periods of time, we're never going to really understand what the role of telomere uh, is in, uh, in, uh, in, in aging. And I also believe it's very unlikely that the government agencies, foundations, are likely to support large-scale longitudinal telomere research studies. So therefore, the only way we're going to advance this is through the private sector. Uh, people are going to have to find a profit motive or they're going to have to find a reason to do these studies and to step up and determine if all these associations that all of us have been living with and hearing about for decades um, will hold up in really well controlled, uh, placebo controlled studies. So this is the, this is the issue. I borrowed this slide from Steve uh, Matlin, who's the CEO of LifeLink, uh, which is really talking about all the methods that we use for measuring telomeres. So when we talk about science this afternoon, I think this is an important slide to think about. So there are different ways that you can measure telomeres. I think most of us are aware of the southern blot, TRF, and now the dot blot that uh, uh, Abraham, uh, Abraham has, has come up with. Everybody's familiar with the qPCR, and that's been the sort of the basis of a new company from Liz Blackburn and Cal Harley uh, called Telome Health. And there's also another company in the United States that, that will, for a certain price, uh, do qPCR for telomeres. And we'll come back to that in a second. In addition, um, Peter Landsdorf up in Vancouver has a company called uh, Repeat, uh, or Repert, I'm not sure what that is, Repeat I think it is, where he uses flow cytometry. And then Maria has started a company here with Steve called LifeLink, of which I'm uh, a consultant to them, uh, which they use two different procedures, uh, high throughput QFISH on blood samples and perhaps in the future on on uh, on on, uh, on buckle scra uh, scrapings. And then there's also the QFISH on tissues, which uh, Maria is called telomapping. In addition, there's a way to look at telomeres using this technique called single telomere length analysis, or STELA. And each of these have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the, the, the good news about these is that you can do multiple samples. So qPCR is less expensive. It's fast, but you can do lots of samples. Flow cytometry is a little bit challenging doing a lot of samples, but you can do it. And you sort of get not only average telomere length, but you can also, with flow cytometry, get a, a, some indication of the percentage of short telomeres. With uh, QFISH, which you've seen a number of those pictures in, in various talks here, this is actually, I think, gives you the most valuable information. You can analyze single cells, you can do this on high throughput now, and you can get populations, et cetera. And so I think what we have to do is think about what value we get from each one of these assays. And I just want to remind everybody, it's the shortest telomeres that lead to signal-induced uh, growth arrest that is responsible for senescence. This is a, a, a picture from an experiment we did a number of years ago where Woody and I actually figured out which of the chromosome ends were the shortest that led to the growth arrest of cells. It turns out that chromosome 6P often was one of the chromosome ends that became short first. And this is a, a picture of the nucleus of a BJ fibroblast just about two doublings before it would have gone full senescent and not been able to divide. And what we see here is sort of the gamma H2X 53BP1 DNA damage foci. And here we see one of our longer chromosomes, Q7, 7Q I mean, that uh, this is a uh, back that's right next to a telomere. And here's chromosome 6P back and you see that the second allele is right in 
this DNA damage focus, suggesting that at least in this particular cell, a single uncapped telomere is sufficient to drive these cells into growth arrest. And it is the shortest telomere, not the average length of telomeres. So I ask the question very simply. If you were to take a biopsy from a patient that had uh, the possibility of, of prostate cancer, which we do all the time, and you took this biopsy, and this is from the same patient, this is some normal prostate from this patient that had been hybridized by QFISH, uh, and you can see these are the luminal epithelial cells, here are the basal cells where the laminin is uh, sort of staining, uh, and here's stromal epithelial, and you can't say a lot about this is from H&E, but you can clearly see that there's reasonably strong signals in the luminal epithelial, the strong signals in the basal cells, or strong signals in the stromal cells, and right next to this tissue is what we call a prostatic endoepithelial neoplasia, or a pin lesion. And here, this is work by Alan Meeker, he has shown that the luminal epithelial cells have critically short telomeres, almost signal-free ends. The basal cells are still positive, and these are positive. Now, if you took this biopsy and just isolated DNA and did qPCR for average telomere length, I ask you a very simple question. What use would that be? What could you do with that information? My argument is you can't do very much because it's only average. It would be averaging out this critically short telomeres that might be telling you something about disease progression, whereas all this other background would be getting in the way. So I think that looking at cells, I'm a, I'm a cell biologist, I've looked at cells all my life, and it just seems to me looking at cells and looking at the histology is really important, and it's going to be important whether you're looking at blood, saliva, or whatever. I think we need to be able to, to characterize not only the average telomeres, length, but also the fraction of cells that have the shortest telomeres. So here are some of the issues that we have to sort of deal with, I think, in this field. Most telomere length tastes use peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and these are mixtures of cells, some of which are short-lived and some more susceptible to oxidative damage. This does not really test the stem cell pool, but it may explain some of the telomere length reversibility. So there's been a number of studies where individuals have actually said you have critically short telomeres and then, like an, an obesity obese person and then they lose weight and all of a sudden their telomeres in the peripheral blood normalize again. How do you explain reversibility uh, and under those circumstances is because the stem cells we're not really measuring, right? We're just measuring the peripheral cells, which are a mixture of, uh, of granulocytes and lymphocytes and things like that. So that's, that's an issue we have to keep in the back of our mind when we measure uh, blood cells. The reliability. Are these tests accurate within 5%? People have argued for years that, you know, the problem with TRF and all these other things is that if you did three sequential samples uh, from the same person, would you get the same results? And so in order for this to become a useful entity of measuring telomeres, we have to have this sort of quality control of being able to have very reproducible results. And again, I'll just bring up what does average telomere lengths really mean? And what we have to deal with, which I think the field is still struggling is, what do a few short telomeres really mean, in fact, if it's reversible? So we need to be dealing with some of these things when we're talking about telomeropathies or telomere length measurements in almost any disease. And then the bottom line, in which was the nature of this, uh, this session, is what can we do about short telomeres? What are the interventions we could do? And we heard from Steve earlier about maybe putting telomerase into cells may not be necessarily always a good thing. But what I sort of summarize, and this is I've sort of borrowed this from Judy Campisi, the effects of putting telomerase into cells are it would certainly slow down the rate of telomere loss. Uh, it's been shown by Judy and others that it would improve extracellular matrix and immune cell structure function, so that's a good thing. Prevents or slows down the rate of genomic instability, that's a good thing. You might be able to activate renewal pathways, so that's a good thing. And you might be able to increase repair, resistance to stress-induced apoptosis. So those are all good things. The problem is that putting in telomerase into cells unregulated increases the doubling for normal cells, which could lead to an increased chance of mutations occurring. And it could also lead to an increased doubling for pre-malignant cells and increase the chance of the mutations leading to the next step of tumor uh, formation. And so we have to think about what are the best indications for introducing telomerase if we're going to do that, or things that activate telomerase. Is there a risk and how can we minimize those risks? And a lot of people have a lot of good ideas about how to advance that.
So today, uh, the topics are telomere length measurements, interventions for treatment of telomeropathies, which age-associated diseases are due to short telomeres, and can they be prevented with telomere therapies? And we have four speakers today. Uh, we're going to start with uh, uh, Ju Lin, who's uh, from Liz Blackburn's lab, who's going to talk about telomeres and lifestyle factors short and uh, factors short, uh, give us sort of a short talk. Javier uh, Benitez is going to talk about some really interesting work he's uh, recently done about uh, genetic anti Participation is linked to certain genetic uh, inherited forms of cancer. Uh, Indrajit uh, Dokal is going to talk about DKC and some of the new work he's been doing. And we're going to end up with Leonard Rudolph, who's going to talk about functional genomics and analysis of telomere dysfunction induced aging. And hopefully, he'll talk something about liver cells, which he's done some nice work. No, not today. Okay. Anyway, on that note, I think we'll introduce uh, Ju Lin, who's going to give our first, uh, first talk. June? 